what we're looking at here, this is the title page of their book. Um, I did bring the original 1880 copy of the book, if anybody wants to see it afterwards. Um, and there are, I made about a half a dozen bookmarkers here. They're up next to the model. First come, first serve if you want a bookmark. Um, so what this is is the uh, title page of the book. Um, I wasn't too original when I titled the lecture. I shortened the title of their book is what I did. Now, <clears throat> to put this in context, you have to kind of, under, we have to back up a little. You gotta, we have to kind of understand. They didn't do this first. They weren't the only ones, the, the, or the original ones. We need to talk briefly about a guy. His name is Alfred Johnson. He's 29 years old. In 1876, he was a Gloucester fisherman, and he sailed alone across the Atlantic in a 20-foot decked over dory. He left Gloucester, Mass, and he arrived in Pembrokeshire after a 64-day voyage. His boat was painted red, white, and blue, and it was named the Centennial because 1876 was the centennial of the uh, United States. So this is a, that's actually an old stereophonic uh, picture of Johnson leaving Gloucester. And believe it or not, his original boat still exists today in the Cape Ann Museum. And you can go see it. Um, that's the original boat. Now, that's not Johnson behind him there, uh, behind the boat. That, this guy up here, that's, that's Howard Blackburn. And he actually got involved with uh, some of this ocean cruising later, too. So that's uh, Johnson's original boat. And last summer at the Salem Boat Festival, I met this fellow. Uh, Dan Noyes from Ipswich, who created a sailing replica of the Centennial. Uh, I had a nice chat with him, but even he hadn't heard of the Andrews Brothers. He heard about it from me. Um, so it was really it's something to go stand next to the, a, a small boat like that and imagine what it would be like to go across the Atlantic. No. So <laughs> it, it, the interesting thing about Johnson is when he was an old man, uh, they asked him, so uh, Al, why did you take that voyage? And he, his reply, because I was a damn young fool, just like they said I was. <laughs> so he was the first one to do it. With this, this voyage, he started a fad of one or two people crossing the, the ocean in boats of decreasing size, and they were competing for time. Um, you'd get fame. Of course, this was all big in the papers. Um, there was, you might get a, a, sometimes the uh, news the media would put a, a prize, a bounty, to, for the people who could do it, because it, it, it was selling newspapers, okay? So in 1877, the second was done by Thomas and Joanna Crapo. They're from New Bedford, okay? They left Chatham, June 2, 1877, in a decked over, this is a scaled down whale boat. It was 19 feet, foot, seven inches long, shorter than 20, okay? So they landed in the Skilly Isles after a 49-day voyage. They published an account of their voyage called Strange But True. And these are very interesting, Crapo and uh, John, very interesting of their own, but if I talked about them, we'd never get to the, to the Beverly guys. So the third crossing, well, actually, here, here's another nice painting of Thomas and Joanna. Um, I, have, I, I often wonder if she was talking, uh, you know, what she might have been saying to her husband out here in the storm, right? <laughs> Thanks for taking me along, honey. This is just, just a really great time. So, okay, so the third crossing is Beverly's own Andrews Brothers. Their boat was exactly 19 feet, okay? Get the picture? The boats are shrinking. Now, eventually, the boats get down to about 15 feet, and that's when these people go out and they don't come back. <laughs> so, to be perfectly clear, the Andrews brothers made the third voyage as, par as, as part of this fad. Okay, and that brings us right to the brothers Andrews. Here they are, dapper and dashing in their mustaches and matching suits, aren't they? Okay, so now part of my presentation, I've summarized a lot of it, but I also um, use a lot of quotes from Bill Andrews. I figure after he's been dead for 140 years and forgotten completely all about um, by reading his quotes, I can kind of bring him back to life just for a little bit. So <clears throat> William Albert Andrews on the left there, 
He was born in Manchester by the sea in 1842, moved with his parents to Beverly when he was seven. During his youth, he was apprenticed to a carpenter and became a skilled mechanic. In 1861, he joined the Union Army for the Civil War and served four years, sometimes as a color bearer. He fought in 25 battles and was wounded three times. After the war, he got married and moved to Cambridge, where he worked at the Chickering Piano Factory. In 1878, at the time of the voyage, he was 35 years old, married with three children. He had made one prior fishing trip to the Grand Banks. William had blue eyes and a red beard. He was brave and bold, but sometimes to the point of being reckless. So his younger brother, Asa, Walter Andrews, he was born in Beverly in 1855. He went by his middle name, Walter, and he grew up to be a fisherman. He made seven voyages to the Grand Banks and had several narrow escapes from being lost. He's described as having an inborn love of the sea. In 1878, he was 23 years old in Sigel. Now their book editor, Dr. McCauley, says, quote, these Beverly boys do credit to the physical constitution and adventurous spirit of the New England race. So the first idea for their voyage, here we have a, a map of 1879 Beverly. Okay, they left in 1878. So this, this is the Beverly of the Andrews brothers. This is, wh this is where they lived. And just briefly here, uh, notice there's not a high-rise apartment in sight. <laughs> but um, we're going to talk... We're going to talk briefly about this part down near Dane Street Beach and area. Uh, the harbor comes up, and there's a building up around in here that comes up in the story. Uh, now, a little off topic, but interesting to note. Notice this ferry boat down here. Boy, this looks kind of an odd position for a ferry boat. I mean, when we're sitting here at Independence Park, the boat traffic all goes this way. So what's up with this? <coughs> well, this uh, here. That's, this is Lobster Rocks. That still exists. That's a pile of granite with a day marker in it. There's one there. There's another one here done by Salem Willows called the Ram's Horn. And then if you're looking at from Independence Park, you look straight out, there's another one right out about here. That's Monument Bar. The channel that we know wasn't dredged till about 19, in the 1920s. So this ferry boat is following the contour of the original channel at that time. So. Um, so moving right along, this is, uh, and this is verbatim from the book, chapter one, page one. First idea of the voyage. Quote, it was a splendid afternoon in the month of September, 1877. Two brothers, William A. Andrews and Asa Walter Andrews, were seated on the cliffs above the entrance of Beverly Harbor in New England. A refreshing breeze was blowing from the south and wafting numerous small boats on the waters before them in every direction. It was a delightful locality on the brow of a bluff and the scene unexcelled by any on the east coast of America. On the left was the pleasant rural residence of the Burgess family, which is what we call Lynch Park, while on the right across the entrance to the harbor was the well-known Juniper Point with Lowell Camp, a favorite holiday resort. Juniper Point is the tip of Salem Willows. Gazing from the height out onto the broad Atlantic, Beyond the numerous islands on the coast, one of the brothers broke a long silence by saying to the other, let us cross the old ocean in one of these dories, pointing down to a number of boats that lay moored almost under where they were sitting. Give me a hand, said the other, I'll go with you. And they shook hands, agreeing to make the voyage. It was a sudden impulse, but the purpose was formed and they kept to it. Uh, close quote. Now their, their voyage was planned for the, the summer of 1878. Uh, this is going to give them time to prepare, to have their boat built, and hopefully give them the be uh, best chance for, for good weather. Um, now, I read that, and I said, where the heck do you go in Beverly to sit on a cliff and look at the harbor? Well, that's what made me go looking back at these old maps. And um, this is from 1879. I wasn't able to blow up a section, but this, this is a later map, and this is a, a blown-up section of... Uh, right here is Washington Street, okay? Here's Dane Street. So Dane Street Beach wasn't really around. Well, clearly, here's a... a now, notice there's no seawall, there's no jetties, okay? But clearly, here's a, a brow of a bluff at the end of Washington Street. Now, there's some more here where Dane Street Beach is, but there's trees in the way. 
So when I read this uh, description, the only place that it really matches up is if you go stand at the end of Washington Street, what, what he's talking, that's exactly what you see. So I think they were probably at the end of Washington Street when they made their, uh, made their, um, their, well, their, their deal, where they, decide, where they had their discussion, they agreed to go. And there's boats moored all along at various times. And on the earlier map, the, the boats are closer to Dane Street Beach. So I suppose it's, it's possible they might have been on this part of the land, but at, at Dane Street Beach, Lynch Park is almost right in front of you, more, the more so than the left. So anyway, that's, um, that's kind of what I think. That, that was my, my take on it there. Now, there may be more than pure impulse behind this, okay? As I said, the, there were two other expeditions that had gone for, competed for time and stuff, so they, they did want to get some notoriety for breaking Crapo's record, okay? And maybe Bill wanted this, maybe Bill was the brother that actually asked because he carried a letter, from, a letter of introduction from Allenson Beard, who was the collector of the Boston Customs House. And in the letter names, his brother Walter is Bill's assistant. So the younger brother might have been following his older brother on this. They also wanted to exhibit the boat. In 1878, the Paris Exposition was going on. They wanted to exhibit the boat, make some money exhibiting it, tell their story. Um, an article in the Boston Globe uh, also mentions a $25,000 inducement that waits the brothers in Europe. So for a married man with three, chil three children, Breaking the record and stuff is okay, maybe for your midlife crisis. <laughs> but to make your wife happy, $25,000 might be a, might smooth things over, because you're gonna be gone a long time, right? <laughs> so, okay, so they, they may have cashed in on that, but that's the only reference I could find to the cash prize. They don't talk about it in the book, and it doesn't come up again. Um, so that brings us to the Nautilus itself. Um, I used this picture when I constructed this model here. Uh, it was one of the, a couple of pictures. It was one of the, the mainly one. Uh, I also have, by the way, uh, some, oh, I told you about the bookmarks. But um, it was unusual that it had a Latin sail. And I'll just read the, uh, the description here, the Nautilus. It was a decked over dory built by Higgins and Gifford and Gloucester in May of 1878. So it was built only a month before they, they sailed. 19, foot long, 19 feet long, half a, short, four, half a foot shorter than the New Bedford, six foot seven inches wide, two foot three inches deep. It was, the planking was only a half an inch thick. It was planked in cedar, light and strong. It was only a half inch thick. It had no flotation, no watertight compartments, cork lining, caulking, or life-saving apparatus of any kind except the one life belt they carried for two brothers. <laughs> It had no centerboard or self-steering gear, which meant that one brother had to be at the helm any time they were under sail. The other could try to sleep in the uh, single bunk they had arranged below. It was about two foot by two foot. Those of us that remember the old, an old-fashioned phone booth, it was about trying to lay down in a like trying to lay down in a phone booth. Okay, so it was rigged with a, a short mast and a lateen sail. It also carried a square sail. For down, they didn't have uh, spinnakers or anything in those days, so that would have been for downwind work. That would have been their normal sail. And then for storms, they had that little guy there. Okay. Now the boat. They also utilized water ballast, which is a fairly modern concept. They carried 60 gallons of drinking water in ten, six 10-gallon kegs. So as the fresh water was consumed, they would refill the kegs with seawater to maintain the ballast. Okay, their provisions consisted mainly of canned or cured foods, like uh, 100 pounds of biscuit, which is hardtack, 30 cans Boston baked beans, canned tomatoes, peaches, green corn, green peas, seven cans of St. Louis corned beef, canned apples, crab apples, but for all this canned food, they only brought one can opener. <laughs> I hope they didn't lose it. They had molasses, but no sugar. They had 20 pounds of tobacco and five clay pipes, but they carried only two dollars in greenbacks and a half dollar in silver, which I guess you're not going to spend any, there's no place to pull over at a store, but <laughs> when, you get to, when you get there, you might need a little money, so maybe they really were counting on the 25,000, right? Mm -hmm. um, they had minimal navigational equipment. Basically, they carried one chart of the North Atlantic, one second-hand quadrant, which we'll get to in a second, 
Uh, one chronometer watch, which was critical for dead reckoning and figuring longitude, which broke. One Baker's improved oil compass, two ordinary air compasses, one parallel rule, two pair of dividers, two homemade spare compass needles. Now in those days, the shipping lanes were busy and what they were counting on was sighting ships every few days to check their position. So here's a quote from Bill, quote, my greatest precaution, however, was to always have a sharp knife in my pocket so that if the boat were capsized and could not be righted again, I could cut a hole through her bottom or the half-inch cedar and so be able to reach my canned provisions. A can of Boston baked beans would be just as acceptable on one side as the other. <laughs> but I never relished the idea of trying the experiment. Still, I always had an alternative for every disaster." Close quote. So that's quite an alternative. But to use the... Um, to use this here, it's, this is basically just a 90 degree chunk of wood. There's a weighted string that hangs against a scale. Andrew shot the sun. So to top it all, he's got to sight directly into the sun and then try to read this on a rocking boat, this weighted string against a scale to figure his longitude, uh, latitude. Okay? Primitive. Um, that's a, a baker's oil, uh, but he talks about a baker's oil compass and he talks about air compasses. This is filled with oil so that the, the swings of the needle are somewhat dampened so it, it gives a good reading. And he speaks, later on, he speaks very highly of his baker's compass. Um, okay, that jumps ahead a little bit. But that's, uh, that's a, what this is, it's a, it's a binnacle. The compass is inside. There's a lantern in here. And it protects the compass from the weather and with the light you can see at night. Okay. So now they're ready to they're ready to depart. They've got their boat and everything's ready. They're going to sail from Boston. So on Friday, June seventh, eighteen seventy eight, at three p.m., the Nautilus departed Boston from Pecoin's Wharf at City Point without a shakedown cruise. They didn't even test the boat. Okay. According to newspaper accounts, there was a large crowd. Many spectator boats were present. Um, Walter sat smiling at the helm. Bill stood in front with an anxious expression on his face, seeming to be measuring the magnitude of the dangers he had to face. Um, the United States flag and the tricolor of France was uh, snapping out of the peak of the sail, which kind of is on the other side of my model there. Um, they were accompanied on board by their friend Dr. Deering and his daughter, who left the Nautilus at Long Island and returned to City Point aboard the yacht Prima Donna. The paper also states that the departure was photographed by Mr. F.M. Smith of the Old South Gallery of Six Winter Street. So I can, the very picture, for, uh, first picture of Johnson, There's, there must be some pictures somewhere of, of uh, the Andrews brothers leaving Boston. I'd love to find them someday, uh, somewhere. Uh, so now, directly quoted from the log, here's the same type of, here's the same, uh, their version of the departure. Left Captain, quote, left Captain Coins Wharf, City Point, South Bass, South Boston, Mass, for La Havre, France, at 3 o'clock this p.m., amid an enthusiastic send-off. When off Long Island, wind shifted to east, was advised to go to Beverly and take the next fair wind from there. So we parted company of friends. But the wind soon came round to southwest, and we bore away on our course. The yacht Violet spoke us off Boston Light, bidding us Godspeed. Soon after, the tugboat Camilla overhauled and spoke us. Soon left Minot's light out of sight, and shortly after sighted Highland Light, Cape Cod. The wind blowing a gale, the top of our binnacle came off, okay, which is that, and went overboard. Shortly after, um, binnacle came off and went overboard. Shortly our white lantern, our only light except the binnacle, went out by the pitching of the boat. Shortly after, the globe cracked and the side fell out. Soon our small binnacle light burnt out dry, leaving us in total darkness. Walter had to turn out and fill it in the dark as best he could, our little craft pitching heavily. Shortly after, something very serious happened, and we, then we concluded to return and repair damages to make our berth a little more convenient and get more substantial lights. When we put about, Highland Light bore southwest, distant about 12 miles, and was visible at daylight, also the Highlands. We saw a shoal of whales this morning off Cape Cod spouting and playing around us. Also some porpoises, close quote. Now what's significant, excuse me, about where they are, Cape Cod Light, that's down in Truro. And 
when you're, when you're sailing out of Boston, when you're leaving Boston to go to Europe on about 40 degrees latitude, that's the last thing you see. And when you're coming back the other way, it's the first thing you see. So where they were, they were just about gone. Truro, Cape Cod, Highland Light, they were about to go when things kind of go to hell here. So they decide, they decide to uh, sail back to Beverly. So Saturday, June 8th, uh, again from the log, quote, wind southwest, sighted Minot's light and bore away for Beverly, arrived in Beverly at 4 p.m. After fixing toilet and eating a few baked beans, left there at 548 for Boston, arrived home at 8.30 p.m., creating considerable excitement, my wife asking, where was Walter, etc. I felt much terribly mortified at losing such a good chance to get off the coast and wondered how folks would talk about our returning. But let them wonder. We know ourselves what we are doing. Every small boat was put in somewhere before leaving the land for good. I felt terribly stiff and sore all over and went right to bed to get rested. Did not want to see anybody. But I did allow my old friend Abbott an interview. Of course, the remark was made that the old saying of sailing on Friday worked true enough, in our case anyway. It commenced to rain at 4 p.m. and drizzled all night. Made up my mind that it was all for the best. Close quote. So the 9th and 10th are rainy days. On the 11th, the rain stops and, quote, crowds flock from far and near to see the Nautilus, the little beauty as she lies moored in the dock. That's in Beverly at a place called Smith's Dock. Um, unfortunately, on my earlier map there, the, uh, the docks aren't labeled. So I, I don't know which one was Smith's Dock. I'd like to find out someday. Um, so the 11th, the rain stops on the 12th, Wednesday, June 12th. Wind southwest, took our departure from Beverly. Wind changed to southeast, course east by south. Had a good escort of Beverly friends as far as Baker's Island. Um, from the newspaper, it talked about uh, salutes being fired for them from Fielders Point and Salem Willows as they sailed past. Quote, spoke the lap streak boat, Captain Warren Jaquith. He told us not to carry sail too long on the Nautilus. Thunder and lightning with some rain at 8 p.m. Calm from 9 p.m. till daylight. Lost sight of Thatcher's Island Light at 2 a.m., run about 30 miles. So Thatcher's Island being Gloucester. That light dropped over the horizon at 2 a.m. <coughs> so to summarize a little bit, after a rough start, the month of June becomes very challenging for them. On the 13th and 14th, they're becalmed with no wind, and they drift 20 miles off their course. During this calm, they go aboard the Jenny T. Hibbard for dinner and to stretch their legs. They're also encountering a lot of sea life, schools of mackerel, mackerel sharks, and porpoises, some of which strike the boat with their tails. On the 19th, the weather is fair. They speak the White Star liner Adriatic coming across from England and, quote, they had read of us in the papers, which made us feel better than turkey and plum pudding, close quote. <laughs> now, that's something else I, I kind of forgot to mention. Uh, the transatlantic telegraph was in full service. So the people in Europe, the story was telegraphed to them. So this comes up quite a bit. They'll meet ships who have read, of, who know who they are. They've read of them in the paper. Um, so June 20th, uh, the weather's turned stormy on them. They have to use uh, a drogue, or what's called a sea anchor, and they have to eat cold food. Quote, waves mountains, truly. So. Maybe not everybody knows what a sea anchor or a drogue is. That's their approximate sailing track. Uh, this is a modern type of a sailboat, but basically you're, a sea anchor, you're, it's like a canvas funnel or a bag, and you, you, the longer your li uh, tethering line is, the better it works. <coughs> and what this does when the waves are building, you want to keep the bow of the boat um, into the wind, into the waves. If you go crossways, very good chance you're going to capsize, uh, and then you're eating cold beans on the on the outside of the hull. <laughs> so uh, they use this quite a bit. So when I talk about the drogue, this is this is what they're deploying. This thing here. Uh, the other thing it will do is um, it drags so that the wind and the waves hopefully don't push you too far from where you want to be. Okay. Uh, so the 22nd, 23rd, it clears up and turns pleasant. Okay. At four o'clock on the 23rd in the morning. Walter sights a green light, which would be a starboard side running light from a ship. 
So they showed their white light and steered for it, but the vessel changed course and sailed away. Bill blew his fog horn and whistle, but the ship kept going. Bill's quote, it's my impression that they must have taken us for the Flying Dutchman who did not want any of our correspondence, close quote. Now what he's referring to in the original, forget the Johnny Depp stuff, but in the original Flying Dutchman story, um, if you met them at sea, if you met the ghost ship, they would try to pass you a letter bag um, full of letters addressed to dead people. And if you accepted this, your ship was cursed as well. So that's what he means. They don't want a bag of letters to, of dead, to dead people. Okay? So later that day, Bill is conked on the head by the sail club, which is this wooden <coughs> spiral on the back. He gets, and I was wondering if that was going to happen because it's awful low. Uh, it does. He gets hit off the head. And later they speak the ship Tyro, Captain Raymond. There's lady passengers aboard that offer cheers. They heartily cheer the Andrews brothers. And quote, we are on the edge of the Gulf Stream, close quote. That's significant because the warm water going north and the cooler, air, uh, cooler water and air on the sides, it breeds storms and bad weather, which is what happens. June 24th, back on the drogue and bad weather. This time, they drip some cod liver oil overboard, which forms a slick around the boat, and it staves off the effect of a breaking sea. So the smell of the oil, cod liver oil, which the brothers found disagreeable, had the side effect of attracting every seabird around, <laughs> and even a grampus, which is a, a pilot whale, that were, quote, they, quote, were all disgusted, for they found only a big cry and little wool. So it smells like breakfast, but they get there and there's nothing to eat. June 25th, whoop, getting way ahead of myself. Weather, the weather moderates, they take in the drogue, and, quote, started from this miserable place. This is wild sailing. How I wish some of my old chums could see old Bill now, close quote. At dusk, a mother carries chicken, which is what we call stormy petrol. It flies into their sail and falls stunned into Bill's lap. Quote, oh, how I pitied the poor fluttering visitor. I took it as a good omen as it recovered, and I had the satisfaction of seeing it fly away into the darkness, close quote. So the 26th, 27th, whales start to come around in numbers, puffing, quote, Puffing, blustering, and playing engine, close quote. In steam engine, he means, like a steam train, um, which caused anxiety. Quote, at night, a shoal of whales kind of made us feel uncomfortable. You could touch some of them with your hand. Their blowing was terrific. I was turned in, and Walter called me. I got all ready to jump out of bed pretty quick. Feeling tired and sick, I lay down again, telling Walter if he should see one coming head on with their mouth open to call me. <laughs> It was so dark you could not see 20 feet. Some whales rubbed their sides against the boat, but we kept quiet and believed in the old adage, if you leave them alone, they will let you alone. Uh, and interesting too, he's called talking a shoal of whales. The modern, modern, we call it a pod of whales. Okay, so the 29th, Bill's at the helm and he's getting tired and he kind of dozes off and quote, Here's somebody helloing, and looking up, I expected to see some hardy Cape Ann fisherman tending his trawls, but all I saw was fog and a deep, heavy swell in the water, and I was then reminded of my half-inch cedar boat and about 100 fathoms of water between me and the most magnificent garden in the world. The last two weeks have been very hard on an old cripple like me. So they've been out for, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, and remember how he was stiff and sore just going after being out one day. So he's... Uh, Think of this as like being in a long car ride, right? A three, four hours in a car of not moving around. Uh, you need to, you know, it, it's, it gets uncomfortable. <coughs> so July 2nd, that begins a three-day gale. And they see, quote, many Mother Carey's chickens dash down under the waves in a helpless condition. What a scene for a painter, but who could paint it? Close quote. On the third, it's blowing a gale. No hot drinks. I'm about used up. He's really getting tired. So July 4th, the big celebration. It's stormy. They each have a bottle of lager beer, save for the occasion. But, quote, no celebration save the phosphorescence at night. My mind was often on Boston Common. How strange the contrast, close quote. So even back then, Boston Common was the place to be on the 4th of July. <laughs> On the 6th, uh, the weather clears up, but the storm returns on the 7th. Quote, worst storm yet. One sea went three feet over my head while fixing chafe gear on the drogue line. 
So Bill is out on the bow trying to fix chafing gear so that line doesn't rub through and the ocean's three feet over his head. The wave breaks. <laughs> July 12th, stormy and more rain. Quote, we usually hove two in weather like this, but we are anxious to get this job off our hands now. So we put the square sail on and the wind working to the west, we drove her before it. Some of the waves would come over her stern and go the whole length of her, burying her completely. But she did nobly and brought us out all right side up with care. So if you can imagine, the only th you know, the waves breaking completely over that boat, the only thing sticking up is you and your sail and your mast, right? So on the 13th and 14th, the weather clears up. Bill gets his first sun observation in 18 days and they enjoy their beans, hot for a change. Um, so Monday, July 15th, they go on board the British Brigantine, made of Langlin, Captain Ring, took dinner and lunch and stretched our legs and had a good time generally. In the evening, the fog bank in the eastern sky was as, uh, this is a quote, the fog bank in the eastern sky was as black as ink and dismal as no name for it. The Nautilus reminded me of the meeting of Philip Vanderdecken and his father, captain of the Phantom ship for the last time before dissolution. That's another Flying Dutchman reference. We can come back to that at the end if people are interested. July 16th, another green light sighted at midnight. This is a quote. Another green light sighted at midnight. Show my, showed my light and bore down on him, but he bore away from me, taking me for a steamer or a nondescript. But I gave chase, and getting over their scare, they hove to. I ran alongside and explained things. She proved to be the Norwegian bark Frank, Captain Peterson. He knew my friend, Modi, in Boston, also had read of us in the papers. Could not make us out. Had to rub his eyes a long time before he would believe he was awake and we were a legitimate Yankee craft. <laughs> Wanted us to come on board. We declined. My chronometer watch has been useless to me for the last week, refusing to stay wound. A very bad mishap." Close quote. So now, on July 17th, this is a kind of a long quote, but this is, a, this is an interesting part. They're 34 days out, and this is all Bill, quote, I have never took much stock about sea serpents, but I have good reason to believe, after what I saw last evening before dark, that there are denizens of the deep that have never been thoroughly explained or illustrated by our zoological societies. It was during a moment of intense calm, and I had been watching some whales sporting at a short distance behind me when on turning and looking in the opposite direction, I was startled to see what appeared to be part of a huge monster in the shape of a snake. It was about 200 feet off. I saw 12 or 15 feet of what appeared to be the tail of a huge black snake from five to 15 inches in diameter, the end being stubby or round and white. It was in the air in a corrugated shape and motion and in the act of descending. I also saw a dark shadowy form in the water corresponding with the tail. Also the wake on the water as if more had just gone down the whole thing being in motion after the manner of a snake. Also heard the noise of the descending part and saw a splash in the water. Walter, being just at that moment at the cuddy where I keep the hatchet, getting some tea for supper, I told him to pass me the hatchet quick, which he did. He heard the splash and saw the form in the water. I wanted the hatchet not because I thought I should have to use it, but because I thought it would be a good thing to have it handy in case I should want to use it. <laughs> Walter had a swim an hour, be an hour before the near the boat, and the thought of sea serpents being around kind of took away his relish for that kind of sport for the present. During the night, we heard from time to time the most horrid noises behind us that we ever heard on the water, splashing and breathing in a loud, wheezy manner, but that we took to be whales. This morning we saw and heard whales beating the water with their tails three miles off, throwing the water to a great distance in the air. We thought if they only saw fit to give Nautilus one of those blows, that would settle our case here and save funeral expenses." <laughs> Close quote. So what did Bill see? Was he nuts? Was he drunk? Well, there is a creature called an oar fish, uh, also called King of Herring. Um, this one's silver, but if you Google oar fish, you can look at enough of, some of them, are, some of them are dark. This one's probably, I don't know, 12 feet, 15 feet. Um, but there are examples that grow to 30. So maybe he saw something like this. It's got a stubby tail. Generally, they're very deep water. They live about 600 feet down. Um, 
when they are spotted near the surface, they're usually sometimes seen swimming with schools of herring, okay, and they've got this red plume on the front. Um, so that's where they get the name, nickname King of Herring. They appear to be leading the school, all right? And um, it certainly is like a, a snake. They, they wash up on the beach and everybody thinks it's a, a sea monster, but um, they do exist. They're just r rarely seen because they're so deep water. Okay. Um, Thursday, July 18th. <clears throat> Quote, last night Walter had a hemorrhage, coughed up considerable amounts of blood, said he felt better after it apparently, continued bleeding through the night at intervals, went on board Nellie Crosby, Captain Bain, for breakfast. Captain Bain said he has seen several sea serpents. Friday, July 19th, Walter's, he Walter's hemorrhage is worse, says he's not afraid to die, but he wants to get over first. Imagine a 23 years old. Saturday, July 20th, Walter's hemorrhage continues. You can imagine my thoughts under the circumstances. So what he's probably got is tuberculosis, okay? And that, um, when you're coughing up blood, um, the end is near. Um, so you have to kind of think, gee, what's, what's Bill gonna do if his brother should expire? You know, what would you do? Um, so this brings this Here's another uh, Beverly reference coming up here. Sunday, July 21st. This is the next day. Observe the Sabbath with one usual custom of our town, viz. baked beans and coffee for breakfast. We had no brown bread. The baker did not come around, and we could not get to Elm Square or Stickney's at Beverly. So we made a virtue of necessity. Uh, just briefly here, when I said there was a building up to, uh, in the, on that map, what I was referring to is Stickney's Bakery on Lovett Street, okay? Uh, very popular. If you talk to the, the people at uh, Historic Beverly last month put a um, thing on their Facebook page, a post about Beverly and beans. And um, apparently the thing to do back in the days, uh, you would take your horse and buggy and your bean pot and you'd go on down to Stickney's on Saturday night. You'd get a, a pot of beans and a loaf or two of fresh bread and that was your Saturday night supper. And apparently, according to Bill, the leftovers would be your Sunday breakfast, okay? Um, so that's Stickney's. So the same day, during a calm, we spoke the American bark C.L. Kearney of New York, went on board for lunch and supper. Captain Jackson gave Walter a bottle of Friar's balsam, which stopped his bleeding. So his life is saved by this stuff. It's called Friar's balsam. Uh, it's an old medicine. It was invented in about 1760. Uh, benzoin from a, a, a tree, uh, from an exotic tree. Uh, you can use it topically to st stop bleeding. You can drink it. Although, if you, I don't know if you can read the label, but it says mixed with sugar. So it must taste awful bad. <laughs> and, um, or uh, you can put it in hot water and breathe it as an uh, expectorant. So for whatever, for Walter's breathing, uh, bleeding and lung troubles, um, it, it fixed him up so he, he, he didn't die on the boat. He was able to get across, okay? Um, and what, so Bill, after this, uh, Bill's uh, obviously got some relief uh, over this and he, he uh, ends with a story, a, a quote of, oh, bury me not in the deep, deep sea. These words came low and mournfully at the close of the day, etc." What he's quoting is a, an old popular poem called The Ocean Burial, which if we have time at the end, I can go back and read because it, it really suits Walter's uh, situation to a T. Um, July 23rd, rain and mist with squalls. Spoke the Italian brig Pap. Captain, no comprehend, speaky too much Italian for us. Saw a splendid meteor at night. When it burst, it lit up all around like a skyrocket. Our Nautilus now reminds me of Longfellow's Hiawatha, where every stride he strode a mile. Um, so what I should probably point out at this uh, point is um, the first 26 days of the, uh, the first third of their voyage took 26 days. The, um, the final two thirds they were able to, able to accomplish in only 19. So, I'm going to lose a page here. Pardon me. I 
hope that came up later. No. Okay. Now we're right on schedule. So that um, that's the thing to keep in mind. The, uh, the first part of the voyage was tough going, and it got better at the end. So like Hiawatha, every stride he strode a mile. They're making good progress. Um, July 25th, fog and rain. They speak the steamship Daniel Steinemann of Antwerp, said he would report us. Fearful high and bad seas, we are nearing Great Soul Bank and are now on soundings. The Nautilus here threw her boom over the top of her mast three times, and we had to jibe here three or four times in order to get it back. So this, what he's talking about is this, went over, flipped over to the other side of the mast quite unintentionally. Wow. And that, was a, that would be an issue, a big problem for them because you can't lower the sail now, and um, chances are it could rip. The top of the mast could rip right through it. So they had a bit of a problem there. And some of the worst weather comes at the end of the voyage because they're, they're on soundings, the bottom is getting shallower again. So as the huge ocean waves come in, they build to great height. Uh, so July 26th, ran on to the Great Soul Bank. The weather is bad and the Nautilus is back on the drogue. Quote, this is the worst we ever did see. Water blown into smoke with the wind. Had to throw more oil this time for our lives, make no mistake. So they had to resort to their, their oil to try to keep the seas down. On the 27th, the weather moderates, and Bill says, quote, we must get away from here if we are to have any regard for our lives, 44 days from home. On the 28th, quote, bad choppy seas which make Nautilus pound awfully and quiver in every part of her, unquote. They could smell new mown hay, and they saw rock weed in the water, and they could tell by the color of the groundswell that they were, quote, in the vicinity of old England close quote. So they cite Bishop's Rock Lighthouse at 8 p.m., 45 days from Thatcher's Island. So there's the Bishop's Rock Lighthouse. That's the first thing they would have seen coming over. On the 29th, they're trying to make for what's called the Lizard on the southeast of the Skilly Isles. The Lizard's down here. Okay. Now here's kind of another um, long quote from Bill, but we'll, um, but um, what's kind of neat about it is uh, to look at this picture and read his description. Uh, for all of his faults or whatever, Bill, Bill Andrews was really uh, a very good reporter and he didn't, in that he didn't exaggerate or under talk what he saw. He reported what he saw and did very accurately. Okay, Wednesday, July 31st, made the Lizard Point at daybreak and stand out into the great race off the point. Spoke the schooner Irene, Captain Hooper. Gave us some good advice in regard to channel navigation. We then sailed down the ironbound coast of Old Cornwall, the scene of hundreds of wrecks, not one of which ever got off. The place where in bygone days vessels were lured to destruction by means of false beacon lights during storms. The cradle and hut begged for smugglers and pirates, the home of Jack the Giant Killer, and a better abode for giants, seen as I now see it, could not be imagined. Bleak and desolate, with numerous caves, I will not undertake to describe the first land I made or the land's end, and I confessed I had my mind occupied, and whether the old habits did not show up occasionally, I was in doubt, meaning he might meet a smuggler or a pirate. But I will put in and stand the consequences, be what they will, and seeing a small piece of sandy beach about 40 feet long Thought it would be a good place for a swim until the wind would change. So I went in with flying colors and anchored within a few feet of an immense boulder <clears throat> to protect me from the wind. And such a din as the gulls and wild birds set up, I never heard. It was Mullion Cove Coast Guard and Life Saving Station. After dinner, a boat came alongside from the pilot cutter Grand Turk, Captain Cox of Falmouth. And Jacob Harris heard for the first time that this was the Nautilus all the way from America. Soon the new arrival was telegraphed to the ends of the earth. Now this is Mullion Cove. This is the beach he's, he's talking about. These breakwaters, these are modern. They weren't there in his time. Okay, uh, But it's a nice color picture, and you can certainly see the bleak and desolate right? caves and everything, just like he says. Um, here's another picture. This is a little before the breakwaters and stuff were built. 
So this is a little bit more like what it would have been in Andrew's time. I think this is the giant boulder he talks about anchoring behind, I think, okay? So if, uh, Thursday, August, now remember they were headed to Paris, okay? They still want to go, but they're, they've come up, come up, come up, up, come up on the uh, Skilly Isles here. So Thursday, uh, Thursday, August 1st to the 4th, they're spending it ashore at Mullion Cove on August 1st. The bay is full of storm-stayed shipping, meaning the weather is bad, and these ships have taken um, refuge in, that, in this little harbor. Uh, they haul the Nautilus out, and they scrape off barnacles that are an inch long, which are carried off by the locals, probably for their soup pot. <laughs> Part of the log is telegraphed to New York and London newspapers, and the Nautilus was photographed. This is the view given on the title page of the book, which was the first page I had, which is this. That's their, this is a picture of a, that was actually a photograph. So you can see behind the boulder, right? Okay. Uh, the Nautilus was photographed. This is the view given on the title page of the book. On the third, Bill notes, some of the vessels left today, so as not to be found here if the wind should veer to the southwest, as it often does, for many mariners have rendered up their lives here under those circumstances, close quote. Okay, look at that. Now this is, this is a later picture. There's the breakwater that we were seeing from above. Look at that wave. And here's another one. Wind from the southwest. This is it's clearly Mullion Cove, southwest gale. Look at what a washing machine. Can you imagine no. being out there? No. Um, so on the f August 4th, many people visit the Nautilus. They put the boat back in the water. And on the 5th, it's raining in the morning, and they're the friend they've made, the, they made friends with the vicar of the church, Vicar Griffiths. <laughs> and he's their only audience to wave goodbye as they sail away from Mullion Cove in the rain. On the 6th and 7th, they sail across the English Channel in more bad weather, okay? Thursday, August 8th, entered Le Havre, the fine seaport of Paris this morning with colors flying. This is Le Havre, and what's interesting is there are twin lights, which uh, apparently got blown up during the uh, D-Day invasion. So I don't think the lights are there anymore. But that's what it would have been like. Um, we were met at the Outer Harbor by Mr. A. H. Thompson, to whom I had a letter of introduction from Mr. C. T. Woodbury. We took his boat in tow and under his pilotage entered the docks. Mr. Thompson attended to the custom house first and putting a keeper in Nautilus and procuring a cab, proceeded to attend to the inner and as well as the outer man. We could not have had a better or more zealous friend. The voyage of the Nautilus is over. We were three days from Land's End to La Havre, making our time from Beverly to La Havre, 48 days. So in terms of the uh, time, they, they did, they were in the smallest boat for time. Uh, they beat Johnson 64 days. Crapo took 49 days just to get to the Skilly Islands. Our guys did it in 45, and um, they were 48 days to Paris, right? Go Beverly. Now, after the voyage, the Nautilus was exhibited at the Paris Exposition of 1878 until it closed. It was then booked at the Royal Aquarium at Westminster, London for a few weeks and then taken to Brighton. In April 1879 at the Oxford and Cambridge boat races, okay, that's these racing skulls that are, uh, like you see the college teams and stuff. Oxford and Cambridge boat races, the Andrews brothers had the honor of flying the only American flag on the river while aboard the yacht Una, belonging to Mr. Gus Wright, the secretary of the Thames Sailing Club. The Nautilus remained on display at Brighton until autumn 1879 when it moved to Liverpool and was then shipped home aboard the Cunard steamer Marathon. The Nautilus was exhibited at Boston and Andrews had offers to take it other places, but he went back to piano making in the comforts of home. Brother Walter died shortly after returning to the States. And Bill says, quote, you may hear of my attempting something again inside of 10 years if I live. Um, now, just a word about Andrew's attitude. I found this kind of interesting. Um, I tacked it on at the end here. This is a, another Bill, a quote from Bill. It was my intention before starting to secure at least one porpoise and a shark as trophies of the adventure 
and for that purpose I procured a porpoise iron or harpoon. I could have captured hundreds if so inclined, but as they were my constant companions de voyage and served to occupy my attention with their sportiveness, and knowing that if the whales had the desire to capture me, they could much easier than I could a porpoise. I decided that discretion was the better part of valor and concluded that the golden rule of doing to others as we would that they should do to us would be the right principle after all. And my decision was, if the large fish would not molest me, I would not touch those in my power. Quite a modern uh, uh, attitude on the environment, I think. Um, so that kind of... Uh, Concludes the voyage there. Um, thank you.